If you're interested in having your real estate investments fund your life passions, you will love this upcoming episode of the Russell Westcott Podcast. Let's go! Hey everybody, Russell Westcott here. Welcome back to the Long Form Podcast episode. This will be the Long Form episode you will be watching. You maybe have seen a clip or a short or a reel somewhere. This is the Long Form episode of the conversation I had with Michael Dominguez. So if you're interested in building a portfolio of properties, a portfolio that will perform like a team of Clydesdales, this will be the episode for you. I had the great opportunity of sitting down one-on-one with Michael Dominguez. Michael is at an interesting point in his real estate career. Michael is at that point in his real estate career where he's now pouring into others. He's now giving back. He's writing books. He's built a portfolio of properties that supports his lifestyle. And now he's in semi-retirement mode. In this episode, Michael and I go really deep. We nerd out, we geek out on what it takes to build a strong, sustainable portfolio over time. I'll let you in on a little secret. You don't have to buy hundreds and thousands of properties in order to accomplish this goal. With a handful of properties, Michael has created a cash flow that will support all his life's passion. Enough with the intro. Let's just get after it. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Michael Dominguez. Michael Dominguez, how are you? Welcome to the show today, my friend. I am so looking forward to having this conversation, Russell. Very much so. Oh, you just stole the words out of my mind. I uh, we had a we had a wonderful opportunity to connect. Uh, was it a week ago, Matt? What what day is it? Yeah. <laughs> like what day of the week is yeah, it? Yeah, at least track. We connected a little over a week ago, and we just uh, had such a wonderful time catching up. And I just said, you know what? We 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 can't waste all this amazing material and content we had on just you and I talking over Zoom. We need to do a podcast, my friend. But we need to do a recording. So so thank you, and I'm I'm honored to have you in my house of my podcast. So welcome here today. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Well, Michael, before we do get to all the hard hitting questions that I have for you, I actually have a very serious question I'd like to lead off with here. First, um, I saw this post yesterday about here that you're, you know, you're, you're selling, you're selling the car with the realtor wrap on it and all that kind of stuff. What's going on, Michael? What's, what's, what's happening here? Well, I'm not necessarily selling the vehicle because it's paid off and such like that. But the days of having my wrap and my face on my van have come to an end. Uh, I'm, I'm now no longer a full-time realtor. And uh, the idea of having uh, uh, my lovely, uh, uh, sexy uh, uh, sexy pose of hands to the face and looking, looking the right angle. So those days have come to an end. And uh and so I'm going to be more of an anonymous realtor that's working by referral. Send me retired is really the goal. So that's really what I'm, try, so what I'm no, trying to accomplish. No more dapper Dominguez, if you will? No, no. You're, you're, I'm wearing basically a t-shirt and that's, uh, you know, not wearing pants below, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> with us. Well, isn't so. that, it's funny. I did a, a live presentation last two weeks ago now and i had to sit there and go okay i had to look underneath the tables and i said okay good you all got the memo to wear pants <laughs> so and, and yeah. i had to check myself first it was you know to be honest you know i was sitting there going i go geez i better try on a few of those dress pants because <laughs> it's been it honestly had been uh you know don't get me wrong i've worn pants and i've worn stuff but i hadn't worn like suit pants or dress pants for for better part of two, two and a half years. And, and a couple of them you know, were a little bit snug in the, you know, in the waist a bit there, Michael, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, we all talk about COVID-19. I'm, I'm closer to COVID-25. I've gained 25 pounds since the beginning of COVID. So I oh, need to, oh, hang, I need hang to <laughs> COVID-25. What? Hang on. There we go. I have to make sure I get, yeah, a, get quick on the rim shot there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I've been I've, I've been doing well. So I need to uh, I need to focus more on my health uh, as far as uh, uh, working out a lot more. I, I do I do have a physical trainer that comes in twice a week, but uh, but yeah, I've been eating way too much food. <laughs> That's yeah. what I need to slow down. No, I well, we we may be overindulged, and 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 maybe this is just a indicative of many things. Maybe the economy, everything. It's time to get back to work again, everybody. Right, and many except for you, you're like semi-retired and traveling around North America, seeing all the work, the ballparks in in North America. Um, so okay, so I do have um some wonderful 
a, a line of question that I'd love to help you with. But before we do get to it, I do want to, I do want to, you know, offer my congratulations for your release of your book, The Armchair Real Estate Millionaire. Um, welcome to the club, Michael. Welcome to the, to the best-selling authors club. So, so, um, when you go to parties now, do you fit into the door? Is like your your ego and your head's very swelled that you can barely walk through a door, and it's like, I'm a best selling author. Uh, would you like me to sign a book? <laughs> right? What's yeah, it like, I brother? Was, Congratulations! I was pretty, first I was pretty of all. conceited. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> I was pretty conceited before uh, having written the book, so this certainly hasn't helped me in any way. Uh, but uh, no, it's something I'm really proud of. It's uh, it's one of these things that uh, I put all of my my best material into it. I I'm really proud of the uh, uh, the contents. Uh, I, I was I worked with uh, Julie Broad, who is someone that we both know quite well, and uh, and she helped put together uh, what I'm very proud of, and it's something I'm going to have the rest of my life and part of my legacy. And uh, you know, what I I often I, I have told this story before, but there have been some incredible mentors in my life, and I include you in that list for sure. And the amount of education that people like yourself and Don Campbell and Patrick Franzi and and some other superstars in the Canadian industry have uh, have done for me. And you had really no need to necessarily teach me as many of your lessons as you did that I always promised myself and all of my mentors that if I ever got to that point where I could pass it on to the next generation, I would do that. And, and this was how I was able to make that happen. So. Oh, wow. Well, thank, well, first of all, thank you very much. And I hope everybody listening to this gets a chance to pick up your, pick up a copy of the book. And, and, and I was about to ask you the question is why did you write the book? But you, you, you're just, so, you're such a pro Michael that you just, you just knocked it out of the park about why, you, but, but so, so I'm going to come back to that again and we're going to go deeper into why you wrote the book. Um, but before we do that, um, you've been on a, on a book tour is typically what happens when you launch a book and you've been, you know, on the podcast tour and you've, I think you told me that you probably did about 50 different episodes or 50 different podcasts across North America. Um, is there a story that you'd like to tell about your background? One that you've never told that my audience has the secret inside information about Michael Dominguez. Is there a story that you'd like to share about um, who you are, what you're all about, a little bit of your backstory? Well, one thing that I haven't really given as much uh, attention to is I, I certainly portray myself as being a confident, successful person. And, and as a salesman, it really helps to make that happen. But I can tell you that when I got started in the rain world, I just, the amount that I didn't know, I could write a book on that alone. And, uh, and so I, uh, it was fascinating. I was able to win the, the Realtor of the Year with the Real Estate Investment Network uh, back in 2014. And I honestly didn't feel like I knew anything of what I was talking about. And yet, I, I went forward, I really started to push, and I made it seem like I was still the resident expert in my market. Now, to be fair, looking back, the knowledge I had versus most of my competitors in the business were, were that much better. But, uh, but honestly, I, just, I felt like I was faking it the whole time. And, and I really don't share that very often, where I just have this, this, this fear of being um, a pretender in, in, a, in a world where where you're the uh, you're supposed to be the expert, and uh, and I can tell you that um, you know all of my media and all of my attention was talking about I'm the expert, I'm the guy. But the fact that I felt like I was faking it for so long, and I've shared I, I have shared that individually, but never as a as a as a group thing, where a lot of people are afraid to put themselves out there as being the expert as a as a joint venture partner or whatever, and. Uh, and so that's, that's, I think one thing I wanted to share is, is, is that, you know, you don't necessarily have to have it all figured out in your own head, but you know, even the little bit that you probably already know is still light years better than most of your competitors anyway. So, so don't well, worry about it. Well, thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And I'm honored you decided to share that on, on this, this show and, and, um, yeah, I, I joke is not knowing what you're doing and feeling like an imposter syndrome. The only days, you know, 
that's every day that ends in Y for myself, by the way. <laughs> right? it's, okay. it's, it, and here's the thing is, and that's because you're an ambitious, driven person that wants to do a little bit more. You want to help more. You want to accomplish more. There's things that you want to do, right? And every single day, if you keep pushing that envelope, you should feel that you don't know what you're doing if because that's what you're, you're wanting to keep progressing forward. So you're 100% there. And I'm just, I, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um so I know you had mentioned earlier that you're no longer an official realtor. Oh, one of the questions I forgot to ask you is in that picture there of, you know, of the one that I shared with everybody here, I'm going to do this, this shot right here. Um, <laughs> did you get lots of business with having your, your face on, on the car and did, did lots of business come your way from having the wrap on there or was it, or Michael, now that it's no longer going to be there, or was it a tax write off yeah. only? <laughs> it, it, it's more the tax write-off, um, and uh, and the number of times I got calls from my clients saying, "Hey, I just saw you drive by the the, the corner of Mary and King yesterday or today, or or you know, you're hey, are you looking at your cell phone?" I said, "Well, how do you know that?" And I said, "I'm watching you right now." So so that's the downside is that people always know where you are. But no, honestly, it really didn't lead to a lot of new business. But what it did do is um, it. Um, it, it allowed me to reinforce a little bit to my existing clients. And, and one thing I often was uh, uh, provided by having this larger seven seat van is I would take multiple clients around at the same time. And it became more of a cult thing as much as anything. Like the, the fact that we had some people uh, bouncing around and it, it, people just wanted to be in my shagged wagon. It was, it was kind of funny. <laughs> It's in the mystery, the mystery machine, right? And Scooby and Shaggy, and you're you're out there looking at exactly. you're looking for the you're looking for the deals out in the marketplace, right? Yeah, I know my, my yeah. It's uh, oh, go ahead, please. Go ahead. I was just going to say that um, there were multiple joint ventures that were done in the back of that van, which which uh, if I could have made the same claim back in my high school days with my high school van, that would have been a whole different story. But <laughs> but these were business joint ventures with uh, <laughs> good, people that good, never good knew clarification each other before. There. Good clarification there, <laughs> yeah, Mike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People, people would meet in the back of my van sitting together. They would both see the same property because I would take people around in an investment tour. They'd both say, I like this property. And within, within weeks of, of that happening, they would be buying a property together. So, and we had that happen multiple times. So that was a kind of a neat thing. It brought people together, which is kind of fun. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I know my, my business partner, um, he, we affectionately coined the, um, we call it the F-150 tour. He has an F-150, like a really beautiful truck. And and trucks have come a long ways in the days. And then, and when he picks up and we pick up a client or go through and we do a tour, it's, it's you know, it's a really nice tour in the F-150, right? So, but that is Alberta, you know, quintessential Alberta <laughs> is a truck, even though trucks are, what did a, somebody said recently that trucks are the bane of existence or something. They're a, a scab on society or something like that or something like that. Uh, Must have been an a, a Ontario politician or something, huh? Yeah, it must have been. <laughs> must, but no. Definitely not in the suburbs out here. It's every other vehicle has that F-150. It's amazing. So. Well, especially if you're a real estate investor too, you're not a serious real estate investor yeah. unless you have to be hauling stuff around, right? <laughs> All right. So well, that's what my van was for. <laughs> nice, nice. So, so one of the things that I wanted to do, and before I kind of put all this on, I, I, I wanted to, I coined, I always kind of come up with a theme of what I'm doing uh, for these interviews. And I kind of coined this one as the what's going on interview. So first of all, I wanted to find out what's going on with you, what's going on with the book. Like what is, how is the book? How are the sales? How are the promotion? How are things going from there? Like what is the back end, you know, for the book for you? Like what is the vision for you? Was it just to, to pay it forward to the next generation? Is there a little bit of a business avenue for lead gen? Like what is, wh why, why the book, Michael? Because it is a lot of work. Yeah, it, it, it sure was. It really was a pay it forward situation. I had no intention of ever breaking even or making a profit with the book. Uh, I'm personally not interested in doing one-on-one -on -one coaching or ongoing mentorship or being a consultant. So, so that really wasn't the objective. Um, and I wrote the book, not necessarily uh, for the person who has five or 10 properties, but the concept was, is I, I felt there was a real need in the market. Most of these, uh, these great books that are out there in the real estate world they talk about how to get that fifth property, that 10th property, joint venturing, uh, making money on the buy, like all these 
different concepts. And I'm not negating the value of any of those, but I really felt there was, uh, uh, I saw personally a number of my clients, the, the differences it made in their life by adding one, two, or even three uh, legal two unit investment properties where they covered each other, covered themselves from a cash flow perspective. They were in great locations. And you know the quote I often say is quality property in a quality location, attracting quality tenants, leading to quality profits. And it was that simple concept that I learned that it all started by buying the right type of property that attracted that right type of tenant. And, and I, I basically built my entire business on that. Um, I, 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 as a, as a realtor, I brought that to so many of my clients and the, the millions of dollars that people generated as a result of a buy and hold in a great market like Ontario. And they were able to own these properties for a long period of time because we were not dealing with crappy tenants and vacancies and hassles and just a, just a great situation where the properties are covering themselves, they're making money and it's making a huge difference in their life. And the, the line I often say, and you know, I'm sure you've heard it before as well, is this became a part-time job that, uh, that, that made me a millionaire. And that was, that was the, the way it really became. Nice. Well, so holy moly, you, <laughs> I'm sitting here, I'm trying to keep up with writing notes and I'm switching back and forth and I'm, I'm going off camera so Sorry. I can write down a whole bunch of notes. No, it's fantastic, Michael. You just, you just dropped a, you know, you just dropped a whole bunch of, you're dropping a lot of fire here, my friend, like just dropping fire here today already. And, and you know what happens anytime fire comes, um, a bomb comes off. Ooh, wee. I like it. <laughs> uh, okay, so so let's unpack a couple things you said there. Um, I'm now I'm not here to just say yes, 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 everything you say, but everything you said I 100% agree with. Um, the power of one more property is an absolutely powerful concept that I don't think enough people actually think about. Like, honest to goodness, if a person bought, and let's just take Ontario um, up you know, market, if a person bought one property, even a year, let's call it two, three years ago. That potentially is life-changing money for, for many people out in the marketplace. Now, all things considered what's happening in the market now, which we will get into what's going on in the market now, but that potentially has added hundreds of thousands of dollars of net worth to the family, uh, to the family bottom line. That's life-changing money. That's the one more property. The other thing you said is just absolutely gold, which I 100% agree with as well, is quality over quantity, right? Finding the right tenant profile, matching it with the right house profile in the right neighborhood will have an absolute better ownership experience than just looking at a pro forma and jamming people in because it was cheap and uh, the numbers looked good, right? So, so... Let's talk about what you've done over the years within your personal portfolio. Obviously, you've helped clients out along the way, but you've also bought properties yourself and you own a portfolio yourself. Um, tell me about your journey of your acquisitions and what led you to these realizations of good quality properties and good quality areas and good quality tenants. Well, I my goal became... And I accomplished my goal of buying one property a year, every year for 10 straight years. Now, in that time, I bought about a dozen properties. So some years I bought more than one. Some years I did actually sell a property that didn't meet my pro portfolio uh, plan. But what I did was I started out like everyone else does. And, and I bought that piece of crap property, uh, a sixplex in a B or C market in a B or C condition and, and attracting C or D clients, uh, tenants. And, uh, and because that's what we were told was the right way to buy a property when we were just getting started. I was making money on the buy. I was buying this undervalued property on paper. It was generating a lot of cash flow. But what I discovered as I was doing this for a period of time, and I started to purchase properties that were perhaps a little bit better locations, it was an aha moment when I was thinking about this that you know I, I was successful as my real as a realtor and was selling a lot of properties that way. But personally, I felt that every time I was getting pulled away from my from my selling of real estate, uh, it actually was hurting my profitability because I was making more money as a realtor. So I, I started to look for for properties that didn't want to, that didn't pull me away as much, and it quickly became apparent 
that the ones that were in the better quality neighborhoods simply had less work. And so then I started to recommend those to many of my clients as well, which was a little different than what most people were doing. They were uh, a lot of realtors were taking people to the downtown crappy built properties that have been haven't been touched in 50 or 100 years. I went a whole different direction. I went to the suburbs. I found properties that you could add secondary suites in most cases. And, uh, and yeah, we just kept going, going down that path of buying those. And, and we were getting such positive experiences. We were getting where normally we're finding, we're hoping to find somebody has a job. Uh, now I, I'm being picky and say, okay, unless you're making this much money or this kind of credit score with this much qualifications, you're not getting into my place. And the tenant profile was just that much better. Yep. Uh, fast forward to to now, uh, even during COVID, none of our clients were not paying rents during the during the last two or three years. Even though people were having some challenges with jobs from time to time, no one thought about not paying the landlord. Whereas that certainly wasn't experienced by a lot of other landlords in the last two or three years, for sure. Yeah, I had a, a call with a client just recently, and he was telling me about an 18-month horror story of a tenant over COVID. And it was, a, you know, arguably, I said, okay, what was the quality of the property? He goes, well, arguably, it's it was a wasn't very good property that attracted a bad tenant and the tenant just knew the system and worked it for 18 months, you know, played the fiddle, cried the tears, went through the process and 18 months of paying. Like that was, I was just like, wow. I go, that, that makes yeah. it tough to, to operate a business is when you do that. Um, so really you kind of, you kind of just did the contrarian approach where you saw people go in this direction and Michael's going, I, I want to provide good value for my clients. I'm going to go this direction. And you just started seeing some success and you saw client success. You saw your own success and you just say, you know what, I'm going to just add the value this way to the transaction. Now I would imagine it would have been kind of difficult around the processes because your process of helping clients probably takes a little bit more time, I would imagine. A little more hand-holding, a little more searching out for properties, a little more work to find and dig them up, I would imagine. Did some people during the frenzy get impatient with the process a little bit? Absolutely. Well, sure. There's the, what I need to teach anyone, and I talk about this again and again, is in a 10-year cycle, I was able to add a dozen properties in that period of time. And sometimes as a real estate investor, we get so caught up in what's happening the next day, the next week, the next month. But I, I want to reiterate that if you buy the right type of property, all you need to do is buy one property in a year or even every other year. And you're light years ahead of most of your competitors in a situation like that. So uh, that's one thing that I'd like to consider myself to be above average on is the ability of giving people the big picture to think about and say, yeah, we lost out on five in a row, but you know, heck, we still bought one last year and we're likely going to buy one this year. You're doing okay. Yeah. So once people realize that scenario is saying, okay, let's not get too caught up in it because it's one thing to buy the right type of property. And, and I've, I've paid retail price for many properties on the market and people say, what are you talking about? You're a realtor. You should be buying these properties at way below market value. Honestly, if I could buy a property at market value in 2014 and have virtually no issues going forward, and yeah, I spent a little bit more on the front end, but by not having issues over the last decade, I've now had a buy and hold investment that has that has changed my life. Well, so here, here lies a, a question that I, I really want to put out is, and someone probably is listening to this going, awesome, Michael, everything you're saying is wonderful. How do I know it's the right property? Like the right property is one of those ones there. Do you have kind of a a, a formula or a checklist or or uh, or a framework or how how do you determine the right property for people and for yourself? First of all, for yourself, and then also what you would feel comfortable putting your name on to recommend to your clients that just love you. Like I, I've had conversations with some of your clients and they just like, I just trust whatever Michael says. I 100% implicitly trust him because he hasn't steered me wrong. And I just, the kind of person he is. So the question, lots of questions in there, but the question really is, is how do you determine the right property? Yeah. I spent a fair bit of time at the beginning of my book talking about just that is, is I both, Finding the right market and then and then becoming an insider trader yourself, becoming the expert in the room. So first, let's talk about the right property or the the right market. And uh, 
And that's, that's an important factor. And so I was very fortunate that the real estate investment network uh, was able to provide me with their, their rain chart that allowed, uh, that allowed me to talk on that. So what I'm looking for is a property that's in a market that has the right market fundamentals. And that includes a growing GDP base, a growing population base, uh, uh, just simply more people working, more, more development happening in that area. And so that's the first thing that I'm looking for is if it has the right market fundamentals, that makes me excited. But then I go further on and I look at the municipality itself. Are they, are they on site? Are they favorable for adding secondary suites? Are they, uh, are, are they encouraging development? And so there's a number of factors that we look at to determine what we feel is the right market. But once we find that market, then we want to become an expert in that market. And I, I find I get very nervous when I, I see these slippers that buy one property in Southern Ontario, the next one they buy is in Alberta, the one after that they buy is in BC, and then they get one in, in Moncton after that. There is no possible way that one could become an expert in all of those markets. Yeah. I've actually, um, for me, I'm a market expert in the city of Oshawa. And even within the city of Oshawa, where I am really good for my own personal investments is the McLaughlin area of the city of Oshawa. So I have pinpointed it that much. So if somebody were to bring me an opportunity that's not in my market that I'm focused on, I'll, I'll let it go because there are so many opportunities out there in the real estate world that, and, and honestly, I'm so limited in the amount of money I've got that I know I can only buy maybe one, maybe two properties in a year. So why buy properties that don't meet my profile? That's, that's the yep. most important thing I focus on. Well, so if you know if you're taking notes in the in the cheap seats, everybody of listening to this, uh, you know I'm gonna we're gonna talk baseball here in a second. I'm I'm sorry, I, because after interesting, Michael, after our conversation last week about um, and we just had a wonderful conversation. We talked about all the ballparks and everything that you've gone to, and we'll get to that today too. I was flipping through that night. I was done. I was just like eight, nine o'clock at night, you know, getting old. It's like seven o'clock. I'm going, oh. <laughs> and I'm flipping then. And The Natural with Robert Redford came on, was on the TV and I saw that. And I didn't remember it. What a fantastic, that's one of my favorite movies, actually. And some of the quotes on there, uh, I remembered a lot of the quotes, you know, goodbye, Mr. Spaulding and all this kind of thing. It was just, it just brought me back. And, um, and I, I wanted to thank you. Thank you for having that conversation, which then gave me a wonderful memory of a, a wonderful movie. So if any of you have ever seen The Natural with Robert Redford, my wife didn't enjoy it. She's going, man, is this ever boring? <laughs> it's like so slow. And I go, man, this is awesome. <laughs> so, okay. So um, the question I did as a follow-up to that is, so I would imagine in your book, you have kind of a checklist and and the process and formula. And I've seen, I've seen your book and I was actually pleasantly surprised that you had some of the rain trademarked materials in there. And I'm, I'm sitting there, obviously they gave you permission to put those in with, with their sure. blessing. Uh, but those things are just fundamentals. And I remember when Don invented that, it was, he, he, he not invented, he, he created a framework in order to explain it when he was going on BNN of what was happening in the marketplace. And it became a cornerstone of something. And honestly, goodness, it just started with a PowerPoint slide. And, and it's an absolute cornerstone that everybody should, should find. And, and the reason I think everybody should find that now, especially in today's market, is everybody right now is talking about price and sales. That's the only thing people are talking about. Every headline that's out there, everything on Twitter, everybody's talking about price. And I tell people is price is the end of the formula. It's not the beginning of the formula. Typically, don't get me wrong. Price and sales are important. But the job growth, the in-migration, the unemployment, the economic activity, the money being poured into new infrastructure, um, interest rates, a lot of macro things like that is is what leads up to the price and the sales, right? So I think everybody's looking at it a little bit. Um, they're looking at the wrong end of the formula. Was that something you'd agree with? hundred percent. And, and it goes back to the, the comment that I made earlier where people tend to uh, overestimate how much they can accomplish in one year and they underestimate how much you can accomplish in 10 and the same is true in the, well, certainly the real estate industry is we're right now because the market fluctuations the last year have been just remarkable. Uh, both the surge that we saw up until mid-February across Canada and then, and then the, 
the subsequent decline in value. Uh, the reality is, if we look back in the last 12 months or three years, the values have been unprecedented in how much property values have gone up. And I'm still very bullish about the Ontario market, for example, that I think long term we're going to see massive appreciation going forward. There's a lot of reasons why you know we could we could talk for an hour just on why we think values are going to go up. I, I I'm just I'm very pessimistic that the uh, that the amount of development that's going to happen in in some of these big cities is going to come anywhere near matching the amount of immigration that's happening in our country yeah. and specifically in the GTA. And and as a result, it just means that the property values are going to become more and more popular over time. Okay, so so if you don't mind, I, it's the next question. I just Michael, it's like it's like we're in sync. It's like we're we're mind melding here. With uh, sorry for the Star Trek reference here as well. <laughs> um, I did want to talk about what's going on in in your marketplace, um, and we'll talk more about you. Like you said, you're you're an expert in one city, one neighborhood, but you have your finger on a, a little bit. And I think the the whole sure. Oshawa, you know, Whitby. Durham region is a bit of a barometer for what's going on around the area too. Okay. Um, so what are you seeing? So right now, if somebody jumps onto Twitter, the, the, the most popular thing on Twitter right now is, oh my goodness, look how much less this property sold from what it was bought for three months ago and all this kind of stuff. And everybody is just, you know, they're almost cheering for things to go down, especially if you go jump onto Twitter from your boots on the ground perspective, what are you seeing? Yeah. Now, the first thing I want to point out that it was, it was very predictable. Um, anybody who's been in this business long enough ha- to realize that values just can't sustain the kind of growth that we've seen over the last 24 months. It's been at an unprecedented rate. Uh, we've had unprecedented low interest rates. Uh, we had essentially nothing else to do uh, because of the COVID lockdowns. And so uh, real estate purchases became a hobby by so many people. It became a almost like a contact sport. People were so focused on real estate. And so as a result of that, we saw a surge unlike we've ever seen before. So the fact that we've had a settling down of prices now, this is where I go back to let's let's compare versus, you know, let's go way, let's go crazy. Let's talk year over year. Like we're talking, you know, these are the way we used to talk back in the day. We're not talking month over month or week over week. We're yeah. talking year over year. Yeah, we're year. talking people well, we're are doing still... indexes from February index to now. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, but but if we're looking at June versus June, we're up and we're up a lot. And so, you know, and if, if we're gonna buy, and here's the thing I like to point out as well, is once you've purchased a real estate property, it's not you're not, it doesn't almost doesn't matter what the values of property are at that time. You're more focused on the rental market versus the real estate market. And the reality is, is that the rental market has has not done any negative decline at all here in Ontario because we've saw such a surge in population and we haven't seen a surge in housing to match it. So as a result, the rentals are are just as hot as they've ever been. So if I owned a property for the last five years, yeah, it was nice that my values re- reached a level that never saw before, and now it's come down twenty percent from that. But I'm still seeing properties that I bought for three, four hundred thousand dollars less than a decade ago are now worth close to a million dollars. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I I, I think um, over the past couple of years, and primarily in Central Canada and, and Ontario, I think um, real estate investors have lost the perspective of what a, a normal real market should do. Markets should take time. They go in cycles. They go up, they go down, they gyrate, and over long periods of times, they traditionally will go up in value. And here's the thing. Most people, and I have conversations all the time, and it's, it's you know, I'm not trying to pigeonhole people, is most of it's younger investors in the market within the last five years that only seen markets that just gone straight up. They're sitting there going, oh my goodness, I bought this place six months ago and geez, it only went up and $72,000 in those six months. And I can't believe it. I have to leave in $10,000 on my burr. And everybody has just lost perspective of uh, I'm sitting there going, holy moly, what a home run. <laughs> and they're going, home yeah. run, that sucked. Right. And, and I think people just have lost the art of the patience and lost the art of what really goes on in a real estate market. Now, here we are with uh, 
the old the old dogs, if you will, here. The two. I'm sorry of calling putting you lump in the same boat as me. Is is we've well, seen these things, and and a market should only go up inflation rate uh, over over a course of time, and that's totally fine. If it goes up three, four, five percent, you hang on to a property for 15, 20 years, and by the time it's free and clear, if that's your your business model, um, that's generational wealth that you've just created for for family members. Um, Okay, so I know there was a question in there. So first of all, thank you very much for kind of what's going on in the marketplace. And I 100% echo the um, sentiment about the, the rental market going up. What advice are you giving to somebody right now if they're kind of sitting here and they're sitting in the, the market and maybe they bought a place fairly recent and they had an intention to flip it? And the the values are just not kind of coming in right now and they're, you know, getting a little bit concerned and they're seeing a softening and a dip. Have have you been through a market dip, Michael? And what advice would you give to that person? Yeah, um, I'd say the number one bit of advice that I would offer to anyone who's flipping, first of all, be very wary of flipping because uh, I'm a buy and hold investor. And, and I find it to be a very low risk investment strategy. Once you're getting into flipping, you are depending on outside forces outside of your own personal control. And if the market is, is in a, in a downward cycle, uh, no matter how good you operate your business, you're not going to be very successful. But, uh, I always ask the question to whether it's a buy and hold or a flip situation. The first thing I always ask is, is if you were buying this property or if you're buying a property today, would this be a property that you would consider buying? And if the answer is absolutely, then you know, then I'd say, well, figure a way of keeping that in your portfolio. But if the only reason why you bought this property was to flip it, and uh, and you have no intention of having it as a long term buy and hold because it doesn't meet your profile for whatever reason, whether it's geographically not in the right location or it can't be cash flow positive or what have you, uh, my advice to you is to take your spanking. Uh, get out of that deal. Uh, get as much as you can get for it. You want to have as low of uh, at this point, in my opinion, the 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 key is speed and focus on a on on getting out of a property quickly. The longer you hold on to it, the longer your carrying costs are, especially with a higher interest rate world that we're now dealing with. Uh, that's where people can get further and further behind. Uh, and even if you've lost money on this particular flip situation, uh, you're better off to take your small losses now than to buy and hold and just sit on it for the next six months to a year, because I'm not optimistic that we're going to see a surge in values in the next six to 12 months. I think if anything, we're going to kind of level off. So if, if the only thing you're holding out on is the values going up, that would be a mistake. Yeah. And, and, and be check, check, make sure you check the ego at the same time. And, and I'm saying that cause I'm looking at myself <laughs> in the eye here. Yeah. Um, the ego sometimes is not your amigo and admitting that it was not right. And it was a bad purchase and, and I'm going to lose money. How am I going to save face? And look at me, I'm supposed to be the real estate expert. I'm supposed to know everything. Heck I teach this stuff, right? Um, make sure it's not the ego talking, make sure it's the right thing. And, and I've helped some people, it depends on the numbers a little bit. I've helped a few people is if you can restructure the debt for number one, if you can get out, let's say you were in private financing at eight, 10, 12%, and you maybe can get it down into that four range and the numbers are getting closer. Maybe it does have a suite. Maybe you can do a little Airbnb short-term rentals to jack up that. Maybe you self-manage. Maybe you just tighten the belt for a little while. Maybe you can ride it out. But but I 100% echo what you just said about the speed, velocity. If you can't, fix the financing and you can't make it a cash flow performing asset. Um, pardon the um, Atlantic Canada reference here, but it's, you know, time to cut bait and, and right and go. Yeah. Right. So good. Well, it, go it ahead, really please. is Russell. It really, yeah. I, I was just going to reiterate that is that, uh, you know, keep in mind in the equity world, uh, if, if you're winning six out of every 10 investments that you do in the equity world, you're you're now at elite level. Seven out of 10 puts you at ridiculous elite. The fact is, is that uh, in the real estate cycle, uh, if we're not hitting 100%, we feel like we're a failure. You know, if, if let's say you are in the flipping game and you end up only winning on four out of five deals, that's still pretty darn good. You're still doing okay. And it's, I think we, again, we get so caught up on the perspective of one deal, one deal 
contract said, oh, I can't sell this one now. I'm going to lose $50,000. Yeah, but if I could sell that and then use that money to buy something else, I could generate way more wealth than that. Because honestly, I believe there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of buying opportunities out there. And if the property that you're holding on to is not one that you want to keep and you're coming up with alternative strategies such as short-term rentals and you're not a short-term rental guy or you're looking at getting into an area that you're not really an expert at, Uh, or managing yourself and you don't want to do that. If these are the things that you're looking at as an alternative, but that's not what you want to do, get out of it. But right now, like I said, there are some sweet deals. So take your loss here, make money somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And I always tell, so, so, so as you were talking there, Michael, and you'll probably get this reference. What do you call a, a, a major league baseball player that succeeds four out of 10 over their lifetime at the, at the, at the plate? What do you call that person? Hall of Famer. A Hall of Famer. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so. Yeah. Three out of 10 is an all star. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, so look at that. So, if you're, you're already ahead of the game, if you're in the 60, six out of 10 ratio, right. And, yeah. and, and, and here's the thing everybody was over the past couple of years is was probably, you know, 10 out of 10 because it, all you had to do was put your name on a contract and sit on it and wait for it to close. And it was worth more than you probably, yeah. when you put the number on. But that is not real. That is not real life. And, and the best analogy I use, I was actually on a podcast recently and somebody asked me the question, what's going on in the market? And I said, here's the best analogy I could probably give. Um, have, uh, if, ha, and uh, the host, I asked the question is, have you ever been to Vegas? And I said, and he said, absolutely. He goes, I think the housing market in certain markets in the country went to Vegas and they went on a prolonged vacation to Vegas and they went on a bender. They had the high falutin time. They had, you know, the, the uh, lots of drinks and they just spent it up and lived the lavish lifestyle. Now they're coming back home and they got a little bit of a hangover, right? They got a little equity drunk. Uh, in Vegas. And now it's time to, that first day back at the office after you've done that first day back at work, you're going, oh man, I'm dragging, right? And you just got to get back to work and just start plodding away and get get back to the normal routine again, right? So so I appreciate that. Keep, keep going. Any more you want like to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to finish up by saying it's almost in your best interest to almost forget what happened months from November to February, where the market just went absolutely bonkers. Um, if, if let's say that those four, four to six months never existed, and we were looking at June 2022 and looking at that versus June 2021 and June 2020, uh, we'd be very excited about where the market is right now. We've had yeah. we've had some interest rates going up. We've had a few other scenarios that have happened yet across the country and in mo- most local markets. We've seen a surge in values versus yeah. where they was a year ago. So it's you know, it's a strong market. It's just that we were at such a ridiculous strength uh, and a frenzy, unlike anything any of us had ever seen before yep. in, in this and across across the, the world actually i've done interviews with people in in uh, india to australia to england and they were all seeing the same scenarios that was happening here in ontario i think i think the toronto area was even more unique because of the surge in population uh but yeah the gta has just seen such incredible growth and well, i think most of it's still very sustainable well interesting i had a, a brief conversation with the person and they were you know they had some concerns which are, arguably you should have a little bit concerned like this for and the reason you have concern is for most people right now this is the first time they've ever been through something like this first time they've ever seen a market take a breath a market maybe go down in value. It just, it gets into a normal cycle, right? A market has its cycle. And this is the first time people have seen it. So they're a little bit puppy dog breath. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what's going on. And then they can start feeling the anxiety. And and what I encourage you to do is to reach out to people who have been through this, who have been through these market cycles, who have been through the up cycles, the flat cycles, the down cycles. Find the experience. Okay. Now here's the conversation I had with this person was, um, they were looking at a potential property and let's, I'm going to make the numbers up, but I'm pretty close. Uh, it was like $850,000 for a duplexed property out your neck of the woods. Okay. And, and I said, wow, that's actually a pretty good, pretty sharp price. And they said, but a few months ago, it was like somebody bought one for 1.1 or 1.2 and it, you know, it's all gone up. And I go, but if somebody presented you this $850,000 duplex, Last year in September, what would you have said? You would have jumped all over it. 
right? But now it's like the same price and you're sitting there going, well, now it's a terrible investment, right? So what do the numbers look like? And then when we ran the numbers briefly, um, it looked like a fairly break even marginally negative cash flow number. And I said, so to me, the answer is I would not buy that, not because of what the market is doing, because it doesn't generate the cash flow. That's why I wouldn't buy it. And they go, okay, that, that's good. That's good analysis on how to look at it. And they, then the last advice I said, if you truly believe the market is even going down even further, if that's your belief, price it into your offer. If it's listed at 850 and you think it's going to go down even more, what does the number look like at 700? It goes, well, it's now positive. It's a good number. And I go, okay, the only way to find out is if you put an offer in at that price and see what the seller will say. Most likely they'll say no, but you never know. They might say yes, and you'd be happy to get that $700,000 property, right? Yeah, I, I, um, I do want to share one thing that I've been finding in the market right now as far as where the best opportunities are for, for potential uh, investors. If you're prepared to take a property that has, is currently being rented and is receiving below market rents, I'm finding those properties are offering the best value for the clients. Now, here in Ontario, because of rent control challenges, uh, it's not so easy to get rid of the tenants. But I, I look at that as an opportunity as much as anything else. Because if I could save upwards of $100,000 on a purchase price of a home because I'm inheriting these, uh, these tenants, uh, it's something I'm willing to consider doing. And if I was a potential first-time buyer or was looking to a uh, first-time investor, and I was even willing to consider living in one of the units myself, this is an incredible opportunity to start to build real serious wealth for someone in their 20s or 30s is to move into this property. And that's something that's legally, you can use in Ontario as a means of eviction or buy the tenants out. If you offer them five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, if you saved a hundred thousand dollars on this purchase because you bought this property below market and then ended up spending fifteen thousand dollars to evict the tenant, or not evict to to mutually agree to end the tenancy, uh, that makes a a major major uh, uh, windfall for your for your for your portfolio. And the last thing I want to say on that is. Don't forget about what your objectives are. We get so caught up in, is this a good deal? Is this not? But, but what I wanted to focus on was I was looking at building net wealth and I was looking at building cash flow. And so if, if a property that I'm purchasing doesn't contain one of those two things, and ideally both of those two things, then it's probably not the best investment for you. So look at your portfolio right now. What properties can help you get further along in that process? For me, it was I, I wanted to reach a cash flow number of fifteen thousand dollars a month, and I wanted to uh, have a certain net wealth number. And once I reached that number, I'd reached my financial freedom goals. Wow, that's uh, wow, you guys! Everybody listening, you just got uh, you know, you just heard from some some wonderful wisdom of somebody who's been in the. How, when did you buy your first place? How long have you been in this business for, Michael? <sighs> 2009. Okay. I started as a realtor in 2008. Okay. And uh, before that, I worked in a uh, pet food and supply business. I was selling franchises. I owned a franchise with my ex-wife back in the day. And uh, But I'm now in my early 40s. I hadn't really reached any of my financial goals. Mm -hmm. I was now recently divorced. And uh, and I just, I wasn't where I wanted to be. And so I had an opportunity to purchase the house I'm in right now back in 2006. And the realtor who was also a manager said, Hey, you'd be a great realtor. And I said, Oh, sure. Right. And so, but she talked me into it and I got my real estate license and uh, I quickly gravitated to the investors. And within that, I realized the advantages of purchasing real estate. And uh, so for me, I felt buying real estate was as much to make me a better realtor to provide for my clients as it was to build my wealth. But I quickly realized that the wealth opportunities that came as a result of real estate just, just, yep. it was life changing. When you when you see the realtors in the room and the ones that have the best financial net wealth are all the ones that purchase real estate. Maybe we should do more of what those guys are doing. Yeah. So. so really, um, your story could really be some type. It's like almost like the tortoise and the hare a little bit. And I'm not calling you a turtle, but I'm calling you somebody <laughs> who just 
maybe we'll call you a Clydesdale, maybe, right? Uh, strong and powerful, but but you ain't going to win no thoroughbred race, right? You ain't going to win the Kentucky Derby, but you're going to be able to keep on chugging each each year, and you're going to just keep pulling the wagon year after year after year, right? And and over well, and time... A, and a Clydesdale is a good example. It right. really is because it, it's such a strong horse, and you built that foundation with that strong build versus the, the horse that could get knocked over on a big windstorm Mine is is never going to go anywhere. So no, that's a great analogy. Yeah, good. Now, why? Well, thank you. I, I have to take that as a compliment. I made a good analogy. Hang on, I'm going to mark today's date down, and I did a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so and here, so I would definitely state that the other thing I would 100 percent state about you, and I'm giving you uh, a big compliment here as somebody who is very inspiring to to listen to, is you've created a lifestyle from this like y- your real estate is funding your life it's funding your fun it's funding your um philanthropic ventures it's funding your 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 obscure passion of of things michael what is your what is your obscure passion that your real estate funds for you well, which I, one should you say? You probably say which a, one, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've, I've been a number of them, but uh, I have a, I have a few. Um, and real estate, you know, I was taught many years ago by by some great mentors that real estate should fund your life and not run your life, and that was so important to me. I wanted to have full time revenue with part time hours work, and that's really what the goal was. And and these properties in my portfolio take very little time. Uh, in many cases, a portfolio of 12 properties will take us less than five hours a month to manage. So some of the more obscure things is, uh, well, first of all, I'm a big fan of, I, I bought a Corvette convertible a few years ago. And so I've been able to drive around the country, both, you know, mainly in the United States. And so last year I drove uh, across all of Route 66 from Chicago to Santa Monica. And so that was a nice three-week trip. But I did the same thing again this year. But this time it was from California. I went to Texas and back again. So, and one of the things that I do as well is I uh, I travel around to see Major League Baseball stadiums. That's one of my hobbies. I'm a I'm a ballpark chaser. And as a matter of fact, uh, tomorrow from the day of this broadcast, I'm flying to Minnesota to watch uh, ballpark number 29 of my active stadiums, and then I'm flying to Washington D.C. after that. And I will have accomplished my goal that I set forth over 30 years ago where it's going to be uh, seeing a ballpark in every active Major League Baseball park. So wow. that's my goal. Is there any new ballparks in the construction phase that will come out on that you need? You probably have to go back to that city again? Actually, right now, the answer is no. Uh, and that's the biggest challenge is that I've actually, when these two are added to my list, I'll be up to 42 parks. That means 12 of the parks that I've seen in the past have now since been retired. So any Toronto fans here would know the Exhibition Stadium. That would count as a retired ballpark. And uh, so, yeah, I've, I've been to Atlanta and Dallas back in the last few years because those are brand new parks. So I had to go back to those cities in order to watch the a game of the newest park. So, but right now, yeah, these are the last two. Washington, D.C.'s park. It's not that new, but I've, I've watched a game there before in the old stadium. So uh, right now there's nothing active. So I'm going to at least go four or five years without having to see anything. Uh, but, but I still have other goals. I want to see a Major League Baseball game in a city outside of North America. I've never done that before. And I also want to, uh, uh, my goal is to see a world baseball classic game in a different city. Every time there's a world baseball classic. So I've been to, uh, I've seen, I've seen games in, in Puerto Rico, uh, Japan, Cuba. So, you know, it's, it's fun to watch baseball games from all over the world. It's a very different game. Did you, did you play the game growing up as a, as a young lad? I played very poorly. No, I, I was I was a I was a thinker on the game. I wasn't necessarily the best. My brothers were much better players than I was, but I was the I was the player manager kind of mindset. That was you know I that's what made me a decent player was my ability to think on the field. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy the game. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I, I enjoy I enjoy more the behind the scenes stuff than the actual playing anymore. I and my hamstrings are so shot now. I play baseball once and I end up tearing a hamstring every time. So. <laughs> is, is there a, is there a, a community of ballpark chasers out there? 
There is. Do you guys like have a convention? Do you have a convention and you have like a club and a secret handshake or what's what is? Well, secret handshake, yes. Okay, good. (laughs) Uh, But uh, there's a Facebook group that is in the thousands strong, and uh, and and honestly, I uh, I'll give you an example. I was in um, I was going to Dallas, and uh, and I posted that I was heading there in a couple of days. And somebody then sent me, uh, said, do you want my tickets? I said, how much you want for them? He said, free. And so I got a ticket. And then somebody else told me different, you know, the best hotels to go to, the best restaurants to go to. Like you, you, you post that you're going somewhere and an entire community of baseball fans said, oh, you got to go to this particular uh, restaurant because they've got a big display of baseball stuff. So you get all these, these insight things with your own community. And, uh, and yeah, you are right. Uh, we do have certain places where everyone says, oh, on, on July 24th, we're going to a game in Seattle. Anyone wants to come and like 50 people end up buying a ticket and they all end up watching a game together. So, Oh, wow. That's fantastic. So, so it truly is, gang, um, a, a testament to this work you do within real estate can fund your passions that you have for life if you're prepared to do the work, if you're prepared to have some patience, if you're prepared to get past some mistakes, if you're prepared to look at it over the long term, and if you're prepared to buy the right property in the right area with the right tenant profile, you can take time to go in a convert. Is it a convertible Corvette or is it a... Is- of course it is. Of course it is. Yes, of <laughs> course. And you can go do Route 66. You can go do the Oregon coast. You can go chase and go all the ballparks, whatever your other passion is, real estate can 100% fund that. So that that's what a wonderful story. So thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I want to point out that like anybody who's seen me at real estate events and such like that, like I enjoy having conversations with anyone, but at the same time, I don't know too many people in my circle that that actually wake up every morning and say, yay, I get to be a landlord. That's that's not necessarily what people are actually saying. You know, they 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 like the the lifestyle that real estate can provide. And and that's really, again, it, it's funding my life, but I just don't want it to run my life. And you know, going back with your analogy from earlier, I've got a Clydesdale portfolio now that is now starting to, it's it's that strong base portfolio that I'm now seeing better and better cash flow now over the years. So it's got a point where it's it's funding my life and and it's 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 so refreshing. I was just talking to my wife about this just today. Is I'm actually doing a, another private mortgage. That's another thing that I'm I'm taking uh, advantage of with this real estate market is I'm loaning out second mortgages to people. So my private money being loaned out plus the cash flow from the real estate portfolio is enough to fund my entire lifestyle with money to spare on a monthly basis. And it it almost feels you feel guilty because you've you've reached your cash flow numbers and you know it's like 10 o'clock in the morning and you sort of look and say, oh geez, it's 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning. I should be working right now. And uh, and you say, oh I don't need to do that because I've already like I've already generated because the work that I'm doing now only takes a couple hours a month, but I'm a, I don't need to work any more beyond yeah. that. It's it's yeah. a weird feeling, I have to be honest with you. Well, then that and and I have two final questions that I want to leave you with here. Um, and they're not trick questions, but they're deep. They're they're deep thought provoking questions. And you probably I know how how good of a thinker you are, and a big of uh, a big thinker, and and more bit more than just big, but you're also deep in your thought process as well. Um, what's next for you? Like, what is next? You've you've accomplished many mountains, everything you put your mind to, you've gone out and, and, and accomplished it. You've written the book now, you've paying it forward, you've got the Clydesdale portfolio, you've helped clients. Like, what what is the next mountains that you're going to be um, climbing here, my friend? And, you know, I'm actually, it's, it's a life change that I'm trying to figure out for myself. Uh, my goal is I have got a list of once in a lifetime accomplishments and once in a lifetime objectives that I want to do. My goal is to accomplish as many once in a lifetime objectives as I can accomplish. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I know that's sort of a repetitive sentence, but uh, I believe we only have one life. Like I, 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 I'm not, whether we have reincarnation, that's a whole different conversation. Unless you're but, Shirley MacLaine, of course, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh this is again. I, I, I've I've mentioned this internally, but I've never actually said this. I don't think on a podcast. In my mind, I'm I, I've seen a number of my clients and and 
people in my circle that have gotten sick and, and died of cancer or heart attack or something like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think all of us have had different things in our life where we've had family members or, or relatives or whatever that died of different things. And, uh, and of course, we've had COVID the last two years as well, which is, you know, life changing. So there's so many um, places to go in the world. There's so many things that we want to accomplish in this world that uh, it's so easy for us to say, oh, we'll do it another time. We'll do it in two years. We'll do it in five years. We'll do it in 10 years. And it's, it's really a, a perspective that I'm, I'm trying to, to do now is I'm focused on the next year, the next five years. And in my mindset, I've got five more really good active years left. Now, I'm hoping that my five years becomes 15 and 20, but I'm going in with the mindset that I've only got five more good years left where I'm active and doing everything. So I'm going to try to do as many things as I can in the next five years. And I'm not focused as much on, on wealth building anymore. I'd like to maintain my net wealth. But uh, as long as I've got the cash flow to support my lifestyle, I'm just going to live my best life is honestly the best thing. And I'm, I'm actually trying to push away and say no. I've never said no before very well. And I'm saying no to projects. I'm saying no to consulting jobs. And I'm saying no to coaching. And uh, it's a tough thing to do, let me tell you, because the money's there. The opportunities are there. Saying no is the hardest thing I've ever had to do, and that's what I'm trying to do right now. Well, sometimes, you know, and I'm I know you well enough to to know I can probably categorize you as the same as myself. And this is sometimes us um, people pleasers. Um, that's one of the hardest things we have is people need help. People want some support, and to reach out to help people is is one of the hardest things not to do at the same time, right? So, well, very inspiring, very inspiring, Michael. A um, couple of things here before we do. Um, if somebody wanted to check you out or get online or where to buy your book, where would they where would they find you on the social airwaves here? Yeah. So for those that haven't seen my book yet, it's Armchair Real Estate Millionaire. If you're sitting there anyway, you might as well build your wealth. And uh, and that's uh, that's what the book is. And I'm available on info at armchair real estate millionaire.com as well. Um, you could uh, buy the book. It's available on Amazon. It's available. Actually, I'm really proud of this. I did an audio version of this book and uh, I hired a voice actor. It was a really cool experience. I have to be honest with you. Uh, like you and I can have a great conversation and I enjoy that, but I learned something about myself. I'm not suitable for reading the actual words of a book and reading word for word without skipping anything. That's not in my skill set, And I understand that. So I hired somebody who's very good at that. And I'm really proud of the work that was come. I, I was the, the overseer of the project. So it was, it's, it's all of my words, but, uh, if you're, if you're a podcast listener and you want to get the contents of my book, it's, uh, it's an easy seven, seven and a half hour read or audio read. And, uh, I'm very, very proud of the book. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to know what you do best and, and, you know, you could have just got like, you know, the, the, a legendary voice, like, you know, I know I'm going to ref, I'm going to make a bad reference here, but you could have got like Vin Scully to, to do it for you. Huh? Huh? Ah. Oh, I would have paid 10 <laughs> times that price to have Vin do it. Let me is Vin, you. is uh, Vin still alive? Is he, uh, he passed oh, yes, away. Yes. Yeah. That's what I thought. I, I was, I was looking this up now. The reason why this is a good reference, cause Michael, what's your favorite baseball team? I'm I'm a Dodger fan. I'm not only a Dodger fan. My dog's name is called Dodger Dog Dominguez. So, um, <laughs> and and name. Vin Scully is who? Yeah, Vin Scully. This is something that just for those that don't know, Vin Scully became the voice of the Los Angeles Dodgers in the early 1950s and was the voice of the Dodgers for 66 years yep. until he retired in like 2017 or something like that. Yep. Um, and and if you think about that, sixty six years, the the Dodgers have basically had three radio or three television voices in their lifetime. They've had a guy by the name of Red Barber, and then he tied everything to Vince Scully. And now there's a young guy by the name of Joe Davis, who's probably going to be the voice of the Dodgers for thirty more years. Okay. So like they've already had just those three guys alone have been over eighty years. You say who's before that? There was no television before that. It was <laughs> pretty much the beginning. And and so, Vin Scully is is. Absolutely. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to check out and I, you know, I, I like listening to and hearing 
the best of the best of what they do. And Vin Scully, when it comes to play-by-play broadcast, is the best. You'd find a find a YouTube clip of him sitting there, the way he tells the story, and he's telling the story about this pitcher, and he's just so smooth and nonchalant. All of a sudden, yes, the pitch comes in, it's outside, ball three. And then he continues on with the story again. And it's yeah. just he is just an absolute joy to listen to. Like that is a an epitome of a master at their work. And and what makes him so incredibly unique as well is his ability to uh to re- remember uh situations that happened in the you know in some cases over 50 years ago and remember them to the letter and he'll see something that no one's ever seen before and he remembers a game from 1962 that he was watching and he says that happened and then and then like this is going back years then their their people would actually start to google and try to find it out and and they would find out he was right like he he remembered something that was some obscure stat from yeah. 1962 and he would know it. And cause he was there yep. and he remembers it. So like, yeah. I can't remember what I did last week. And so. The, the art of the story is absolutely critical and, and being able to tell a good story and engage and have that, that communication style. Right. Um, we could go on and on just on that topic alone, but I do want to be respectful of your time. I know it's, I know it's like uh, one o'clock in the afternoon and it's, uh, you know, Cervasis time probably here soon for you. Uh, um, so here's the, here's the final question. And this is the final question I like to leave with most people is um, what's some final inspirational words you would leave for somebody if they're sitting here and they're watching this on YouTube or they're listening to it via podcast and somebody's maybe just feeling a little bit stuck and they're just not sure of that next step. What would be a final message which you'd leave for that person to help them just take the next step and get a little bit unstuck and maybe some final parting inspiring words? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to bring it back to the COVID scenario that we've had over the last two years. We've been doing so many things from the confines of our offices and um, finding properties from a laptop. Uh, my advice to you now that we're more of a post-COVID world is to get out there and start to to hang out with other investors. If you haven't purchased an investment property before, if you haven't for a while, uh, attending local meetups is is sometimes the best way to go. You start to interact with other action takers and and really get to feel for uh, see as many properties you can right now because the market, although you know the real estate market is still the real estate market, you know things haven't changed that much. A house is still a house, but there are so many things that have changed over the last few years that uh, the, in my opinion, the action takers are the ones that are actually out there. They're they're attending the networking events. They're they're out there uh, talking with the other action takers. They're they're learning what's going on. They're dealing with uh, they're building connections with mortgage brokers and and trying to get their financing in order. Uh, they're they're even looking at private funding to try to move forward. But there are, there's a lot of different ways that you can move forward. I don't know what your roadblock might be, but uh, but by getting out there and starting to network with the right people at the right time, I think that that's going to put you in a position to move forward yep. and. Lastly, I, I want to reiterate again that this isn't a race to 100 properties. You don't need 100 doors to become successful. Some of the things that I have in my book, I have success stories with people that have bought properties, as little as two properties and how it's changed their life. And um, so if, you've, if, you've, if you're being honest with yourself and your current net wealth, if you think about where does your net wealth come from, you'll, if you're a homeowner currently, I would, I would venture to say that at least half and probably three quarters of your net wealth has come from your own principal residence. Wouldn't it be cool if you bought two or three more like that and ended up having a portfolio that has just great people that are are responsible and they they treat you with respect, you treat them with respect, and and you've set yourself up for a long term great retirement and be able to pay for your kids' education and just live your best life. Ooh, amen, brother. Woo wee, woo, hang on here. Hey, hang on, I hit the wrong button here. Fire. <laughs> I'm all excited here. You got me fired up here. And, and every time we have some fire, what do we have? We have a bomb that explodes. So, yeah. Uh, Excuse me. God. I just had lunch, actually. It was Taco <laughs> Bell. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, bean, bean burrito here. Bean burrito today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's Michael, right. Uh, thank you very much for bringing the goods here. I 100% echo what you just said is um, 
let's just get back to some basics and let's get back to the relationship building. Let's get back to meeting the people again. Let's get back to, you know, seeing people in real life again. And, and uh, let's just start uh, moving forward with the connections and the relationships. Now, I know we didn't have this opportunity to have this conversation in, pr- in, in one-on-one in person, but this is the second best thing. And next time I'm out your way, I can't wait to have a burrito or two with you, my friend, as well. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to it, absolutely. And getting one of the classic Russell Westcott hugs as well. Uh, looking forward to absolutely. It as well, so. All right, gang, why don't we just leave it there? Um, This has been a wonderful, inspiring tale of what real estate can do for you. I hope you took as much from this event, uh, from this presentation and this episode as I did. And until the next one, everyone, have yourself a wonderful day. Bye for now. I sure hope you enjoyed this in-depth training video. And I applaud you for sticking around right to the very end. I believe in people that show up put in the work, put in the time and effort should be rewarded. If you're interested in taking the next step, if you're interested in going deeper and mastering what you just learned about in this training video, I encourage you to check out the Raising Capital Academy. So if you have found that you've received some value from the YouTube channel, or maybe you've listened to a podcast, you're only scratching the surface. That truly is just one-tenth of 1% of all the content and materials that have been created that are waiting for you on the other side. So I encourage you to check out the Raising Capital Academy. There's more than 100 plus hours of video content, audio content, exclusive training material for those that are interested in taking the next step, those that are interested in going towards mastery, those that are interested in moving forward with velocity. So I would encourage you wherever you're watching this video, around this video will be a link where you can check out all the details of the Raising Capital Academy. After you've checked out all the details on that page and you're interested in moving forward with Velocity, click on the link that will take you towards the application. This is by application only. This is a community program and is for serious action takers only. So if you want to step up your game, if you have goals and dreams and aspirations for more, if you'd like to make a difference in the financial futures of the most important people in your life, I highly encourage you to check out the Raising Capital Academy. Click on that link and you'll be taken to the next step in the process to see if you qualify to take the next step forward for you. Hope to see you on the other side. Bye for now. If you'd like to continue your journey as a successful real estate investor, only two simple next steps from here. Number one is please subscribe to get all the latest information and latest videos sent directly to you. And over here is a hand-selected video a video that's been hand-selected for you to help you keep moving forward with velocity. Thank you very much.